Andrew and Steph, over to you. Thanks, Barry. Uh, my name is Andrew Simpson. I'm also new to this, so thank you for welcoming myself and Steph along. Um, a quick intro from me on what I do and how we're involved. Um, I head up the digital team in DCMS, and what that means is digital comms. So it's the Department for Digital, Culture and Media Sports, social media output, and our online presence. Um, based in Westminster, I manage a team of eight, and we are responsible for lots of elements that I'll come on to for um, the arrangements around the uh, Queen's death and the products that help the public know how they could also pay their respects. I'm also joined by Steph Gray, who isn't a um, member of my team. Um, Steph is a contractor. So Steph, do you just want to intro yourself? Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. So I was a civil servant um, about 10 years ago. I uh, went off to start a freelance business and um, now I'm finding myself freelance again. And uh, I was helping Andrew out with his team on some other projects, including the Platinum Jubilee, uh, which uh, happened earlier in the year. Thanks, Steph. Um, and what we thought we'd do is I'll uh, talk you through some slides about the overall project and what we delivered and uh, what we learned from that and what we achieved. Um, so I'll go into that in a second, meaning you haven't got to look at my scruffy chops for 20 minutes. Um, but also, um, I'm quite used to using uh, Google Meets and not Microsoft Teams. So I'll be looking at the deck, which means if anything goes wrong, I won't know unless you tell me and I won't see comments because I'll be looking at the, the um, slides we've got. So if there are any issues, if someone could let me know and we'll do our best to fix them, if that's cool. Um, so I'm just going to go into the deck now. Cool. Can somebody just tell me that they can see that slide? Yes. Brilliant. Uh, first hurdle overcome. So as I've said, uh, this is about London Bridge, which is the code name for um, the death of the mic. And for us in DCMS, and I'm just going to give some context here. Not all of it might be relevant to you guys because I work in comms. So you guys are obviously more in digital product delivery, but it just gives you a sense of, of the context of what we did with these products and the scale at which they went out. Um, so DCMS as a department had set roles within um, what we call bridges. We weren't the lead department. The lead department for this, well, it is really the palace, but then in government, it's number 10 in the cabinet office. But DCMS, uh, we lead on some really big areas within that 10 day funeral window, which broadly were uh, flags policy. So lowering of flags on public buildings, silences. So that's the two minute silence on the funeral day, the processions, and these are the processions of the monarch's coffin, to and from lining state, and then the lining state itself. We were also responsible for the media operations and logistics, which were huge for lining state because we had the world's media descend upon us, and responsible for leading partners and the public conversation around how they could basically pay tribute to the monarch and, and feel that they could get involved in some way. And that was the real challenge that um, I'll talk through. And we had strategic objectives, and I won't read these out, but I think the importance of this is, I'm sure you're all aware, You'll have lots of senior people get involved in these projects, but they'll only get involved in quite a top level way. When it actually happens, they'll take a much more focused interest. And having worked on some of the big stuff, Steph mentioned Platinum Jubilee, also Armistice, Remembrance Sunday, um, Fourth Bridge, so the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. I know from those projects, you're going to get lots of random asks from senior people who have something that comes to mind that you need to deliver. So having really clear and simple objectives that you say, this is what we're going to deliver against and this is why, and also this is how we're going to measure them, really helps manage those kind of random asks, if you like, from, from across the board and keep you focused and keep your team focused on what you need to deliver. Um, this next slide shows the timeline of London Bridge. So it was 10 days. There was activity, as you can see, across those 10 days. The grey bars are the ones we text on are the products that we pushed out on those days. And you can see flag flying at the start. And then we got more into pushing guidance out, which I'll come on to. And um, you can also see with the purple line that pans over them, that was the scale of, of interest and views on content that we published on GovUK relating to them. This was part of a bigger grid. So number 10 had a grid that covered all government output during this time. It wasn't just our stuff. But having that master grid meant that we knew who was pushing why out when. What we when we should go quiet, when we should cross promote, uh, etc. The next thing is partners. So we work with loads of partners, mostly national, on quite a big scale, and we need to segment these into different groups. 
we had the media partners, which were, you know, global, and we've worked with them for a while. It was also quite helpful for us, if that's the right word, coming off the back of the Jubilee, because a lot of the groups we stood up were the same people that we'd worked with on the Jubilee, obviously in very different circumstances, but we already had those contacts and those networks set up, if you like. And we had communications partners, so I had uh, ins to all my opposite numbers in digital and comms teams across, you know, the Met, uh, Palace of Westminster, GLA, TFL, and others. The ops partners, so they were the people on the ground delivering the infrastructure and managing the public and getting messages back from them was vital. Again, that insight was vital. And then the final bit is our resource. We've got a really small team, as I mentioned, my team is eight people. Our comms team is quite small. In, you know, I think it's around 40 in total. And we had a lot to push out. We called on volunteers and members of, of other departments across government to support us during this 10 day window. And when you, you look back to that period, there wasn't that much else happening all of society kind of went quiet because of that national mourning period anyway. So there was thankfully some resource we could draw upon. Um, I'm not gonna spend loads of time talking about what we delivered because it, it was, well, you'll know some of it because it was all over the news. Uh, it's just to give you a sense of the scale of, of how we delivered. I led on social media. These numbers are, are, are big, obviously, you know, 35 million impressions on our social media channels. Um, and what this really meant was that we had a lot of eyeballs on our content. So if anything went wrong or anything was incorrect, we'd have a bit of a pile on, on, on social and we had to be really aware of that. So I don't know, for those of you who work on GovUK, you have a two eye process for everything we pushed out. It was three, if not four eye. We needed to be really clear and really correct and make sure everything was quick. It was in the moment, but it was signed off and it was a single version if you, of the truth, if you like, because over that 10 day period, particularly as we got towards line in state, that, um, attention on our content increased massively. Um, so we had a lot of scrutiny on us during that period of time. And you can see from the other numbers, just the scale of what we covered with, you know, broadcast, print, GovUK um, and media calls. At the core of that, and I think, you know, what we're really here to talk about is our tracker um, as, or QTube as it came to be known and how that worked. Steph will talk about the process of how we ran it, but I just wanted to give you some numbers of scale and. Um, you know, once we stood this up, how quickly it gained traction and how quickly it gained interest. So during that week, uh, I say week, it was actually live for five and a half days. We had nearly 10 million views of the tracker on YouTube. Um, at its peak, we had 28,000 people looking at it at once. Um, and if you added up in a, in a timeline concurrently, all the time that people spent looking at the tracker, it came to 94 years, which is not bad for a single live stream. Um, of course, that wasn't the only product, and I'll come on to the others we use, but this sat at the core of it, and this is really the thing that I suppose cemented our role, really, and was as a fantastic tool in helping us communicate with the public and media at once in a simple, clear way. Um, Steph, do you want to pick up from the next slide on how this actually worked? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andrew. And I'll, I'll try and switch at some point and uh, I show you all the demo of, uh, of how the platform works. But essentially, as Andrew sort of described, you know, this this wasn't a totally unexpected event, obviously, um, and his team at least have been preparing for the digital side of managing the queue and those kind of communication side of things for about five years. And part of the plan, the basic plan was um, to have a PDF map. Um, and so that people could basically meet that user need of working out where they need to join the queue, because that's the basic user need, uh, it seemed to be. Anything else on top of that was a bonus, really. So they could find out how long they had to wait, um, that was a kind of an extra, um, but the key thing was to manage the queue. So there was always a PDF map, um, but Andrew's a creative chap and so are his team. So um, they had ideas. So when, when I spoke to Andrew, which was about, um, uh, I suppose I'm on a Saturday. So the Lion State opened on the Wednesday after that. So by the Saturday, his team had a plan to essentially have somebody with uh, a phone at the end of the queue um and the phone would be running a kind of live location pin on a google map um and then the uh, back of the office andrew's team would be streaming that map alongside some information using the open source obs um broadcasting software which they've used quite a bit for for other things so they're quite familiar with that um, and the idea was that they would stream that to youtube and we'll come back to youtube because it's a really interesting kind of ingredient about uh, this product and how it worked so essentially, this was a pretty good plan. The only risk was, what if uh, this phone dies? What if there's no signal? 
what if uh how's it going to get passed from one person to another at the end of the queue so so really a, a bit of a kind of logistical challenge and a risk that the the kind of map might break um if any of those kind of technical problems occurs so we but where we ended up with and i'll show you in a minute was having a uh, a plot of the path of the queue and a dynamic pin at the end of the map um, and then ultimately that slotting into essentially a kind of html frame with some additional graphics that gave people extra information uh, and could be managed by the team at dcms so essentially all of that was kind of progressively enhancing what was you know a solid plan to start with so let me just see i'll, I'll just i'll give you the overview and i'll show you this in a bit more detail but basically the the, the core of this system was a crucial kind of dedicated laptop in the office um, which was running the OBS software um, and this was then streaming to YouTube uh, via DCMS's account. So the all the kind of traffic and the weight of, of pressure on this system was 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 going to YouTube. Uh, all that Andrew's team had to do was make sure that the map was reliable enough to uh, push those graphics to YouTube and then uh, the bit that I was involved with was, was kind of how to generate that up to date picture of where the end of the queue was. And that was the, the bit on the left, uh, which I'll, I'll see if I can just show you that now. So let me just see if I can toggle over to my other screen. Uh, Andrew, give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Yeah. All good. good. Uh, all good. So um, what we're looking at here is this is the basically the graphics frame, which was uh, driving the information about where the queue was. So you can see it was an embedded Google uh, static map. Um, and then a, a bunch of little bits of information, uh, how long the queue was, um, and also the use of what three words as a location device to help people actually find exactly uh, where the end of the queue was without having to use kind of coordinates or, or approximate descriptions of landmarks and that sort of thing. So uh, this refreshed every uh, uh, I think it's every minute or so. Um, and behind it was a very simple CMS. So this was designed to run on people's phones so that a number of different marshals at the end of the queue who were trusted could have access to this and they would be able then to um, push updates to the map based on where the end of the queue was at that point. It didn't have to be entirely real time, it just had to be up to date. So you can see uh, essentially people could walk to the end of the queue, um, hit the button, and it would update the uh, end of the queue pin with their current coordinates. Um, and if that was then approved, that could then go live on the map. Uh, if there was some technical issue, they could also say, uh, I'm currently at Blackfires Bridge, and someone back in the office could move the pin to the relevant part of the map as well, if they, that was, uh, was easier. And as I said, this system was kind of progressively enhanced as we started to see, uh, we'll come on to the kind of the human aspect of all of this, but uh, it was enhanced with a bit more detail, a bit more ability to manage some of the content. So uh, rather than the team having to manage essentially a PowerPoint slide of graphics within the broadcasting software, they could actually uh, use this system and it would automatically do things like work out from a given location what the what three words tags were or what the nearest landmark was. Um, and if, if there was some kind of policy decision, like for example, as the queue got very long, it was important basically to tell people not to join the queue, uh, or the queue length was no longer relevant, for example, then it was able to, to sort of switch. And rather than having queue length, it was able to update with the local weather, again, driven by um, a basic open API. So simple tools, kind of simple APIs was a kind of big part of this. And it just meant that humans weren't having to do too much of the manual updates because some of uh, Andrew's team were working 12, 18 hour shifts. So a few days into this, they were starting to get pretty tired and it was certainly possible for them to make mistakes as they were transposing things. So uh, let me just unshare and we'll go back to slides. Uh, OK. Has that worked? Great. All good? Yeah, I think so. You see the slides again. This is this is slicker than the normal for us. <laughs> Should live stream this, um, right? What's uh, so yeah? So that's the basic overview, and you get a sense of how the system works. Uh, the next bit of it, if you move on to the uh, next bit, Andrew. So I mean, the, the core kind of part of this, well, that's what makes it different from a digital service like Gov.uk or some of the things you maybe work on, is this was designed for days rather than weeks or months or years. 
so this, in some ways, that was nice because we didn't have to think about you know, it, it running for months and months and being iterated particularly, but it did mean that things had to happen extremely quickly. So we were iterating and releasing new versions or tweaks three or four times a day at least um, during the lying in state period. As Andrew mentioned, you know, to put it mildly, senior stakeholders are highly engaged with this kind of thing. So people will have concerns, people will have technical queries, people will be worried about the fact that they can't see things, for example, on YouTube because YouTube's not available on the corporate network. Um, so Andrew was helpfully managing all of that so that from my point of view, I was able to focus on getting this tool working. Um, it's also very difficult to fully test this sort of thing with users in advance. So although there's lots of planning time, actually, there wasn't a lot of time to, to really rehearse all of this and talk about it because it's you know a very difficult subject to talk about openly with um, suppliers and others. And also a lot of it wasn't known until the exact details of uh, where the monarch was and that sort of thing, where the lying state would be, was was really nailed down. Um, and then uh, I think, but you know, part of this was was in about lateral thinking, and this is where YouTube comes in because the question of scalability and how to manage huge volumes of interest in the tracker uh, was really kind of taken away because rather than having to think about scalability through adding servers and caching layers and all that kind of thing, by streaming to YouTube, which was uh, an idea that DCMS had, um, it just took all of that away really so youtube became the content delivery network um and it meant that we were only basically needing to to make something work reliably on a single machine that could then broadcast to youtube um uh, we had some basic things ready to go so we had the hosting left over from the jubilee uh, i was ready to go I'd, I'd had some experience with the map api um obviously andrew's team were experienced with obs broadcasting software um, and we tried to make sure, well, Andrew's team made sure that there were alternatives. So although perhaps live stream video in itself isn't particularly accessible, there are other options, including kind of text alternatives on social. But the beauty of YouTube is that it is so kind of such a currency, it can be used anywhere. And things that um, perhaps, you know, wouldn't have happened if we created a website, uh, for example, you know, it would be very difficult to get media to link to a government websites in these kind of situations even but they very happily carried an embedded uh, live stream YouTube video uh, from Metro Daily Mail was very positive about the Q tracker and covered it as well, uh, embedded it in their site. So lots of people's CMSs can handle YouTube even if they can't handle other forms of more kind of complex embedded content. So um, I think that was interesting. And it also meant that it could be embedded on uh, a gov.uk guidance page as well. Um, and then in terms of, uh, sort of the system itself, as you could see a little bit when I demonstrated it, it was kind of designed to recognize the fact that there were going to be some some kind of breaks in the chain. So the three main elements of this were volunteer marshals who were reporting where the end of the queue was based on uh, standing at the back of it and pinging back their location. Um, then there was the, the map itself and then ultimately it being live streamed to YouTube. But within all of those kind of parts of the process, there were things that could go wrong. And because of the volume of eyeballs on the system and uh, the lack of time to fix things, um, we had to kind of build in a bit, a bit of flexibility to correct things on the fly. So part of it was um, discovering early on that people couldn't uh, always reliably report locations because some of the phones were locked down. So hence being able to override things back at the office if needed. Um, the policies change sometimes about how much to report about the queued positions and that sort of thing. So it was important to be able to not always report live data, but actually have a little bit of kind of uh, leeway basically to to override that with, for example, different graphics, different wording um, at different points in the lying in state. And then we, we came to this question about kind of human error. So um, an example of that, actually, if, Andrew, if you just ping over to the next slide, is is this question about what three words? So. So some people were starting to pick up. There's just a couple of examples where um, the marshals were reporting back what their what three words kind of locations were. Um, and they got kind of mistranscribed by email or, or in the office. Uh, and it started to kind of people on Twitter and social media and even some, some media organizations started to kind of cover that as a bit of a sort of, I suppose, a joke story that the government was sending mourners astray. Um, so we picked that up at an early stage and realised this was just, you know, tired people in the office essentially making mistakes. Um, so we uh, had a quick look. What three words uh, has a very nice open API, uh, and then this is literally the code that generates um, the that converts coordinates into a what three words location. So it's it's eight lines of, of PHP here um, to turn that 
into something which had a fair bit of human error and sort of simple mistakes into something which was kind of automated so that people didn't have to think about it and actually some of the team could get some rest because those graphics were then being driven automatically rather than, than manually refresh. So that was that was one of those things. But obviously there was a bit of a risk of, of you know, spinning up new features, uh, exploring new APIs on the fly during the middle of a live service um, with 12,000 live viewers on the stream. So it was um, it was quite a scary deployment, I can tell you. Um, but it was, you know, a balance between doing that and, uh, and the risk of, of getting things wrong otherwise. So in terms of the technical lessons, if we just shift onto that one, Andrew. I think, um, you know, to wrap up some of those points, I think one was that we were starting from quite simple components. This was a very simple system. Uh, it wasn't kind of months and months in the planning. It was spun up quickly, but we had the stepping stones, the building blocks ready to go in terms of hosting, um, you know, experience using social media for these kind of things, live streaming and so on. Um, this concept of progressively enhancing things. So we had, you know, the basics in place. We could make things gradually better, more sophisticated, reduce the risk, um, and correct for errors uh, during the course of the lying in state. Um, and we had to make some some decisions about whether to to sort of try new things or or stick to what we knew was was solid and working. Um, uh, and part of that was just accommodating those real world issues. So having enough manual overrides making sure we had good logs, making sure we we're thinking about people being tired, that sort of thing um, in the system. And then I think my takeaway from this is the, the brilliance of, uh, of Andrew's team in thinking about YouTube, because I, I would never have thought of live streaming to YouTube as being a content delivery network for this kind of information. But actually, not only was it great from a technical point of view, it also meant that there was a layer of resilience to the system. Um, and it made it from a communications point of view, something that all kinds of people were willing to take and embed on their own sites. Just to uh, wrap up then with uh, just a couple of examples. So the nice thing about this watching it on social media was that people started to kind of pick up the, the Q tracker and, uh, and make their own versions, their own spoofs. So someone made a, a nice cream van Q tracking spoof. Um, Alex Selby Boothroyd, who's the head of data journalism at The Economist, um, he spent quite a while, obviously, mocking up a uh, an Elizabethan Q tracker with the, uh, the technology transposed back in time, uh, and uh, a lot of people were, were kind of appreciating it as it went through. Sorry, Steph, that was my pause trying to jump tabs to the classic get off mute. A um, couple of things I just mentioned as well there. Um, the iterative process, we iterated it all while it was live because we didn't have an option to take it down. So what we started with was Steph's map, somebody in the office, as you saw on that screen, overlaying graphics and screens that we built and we could put messaging on that was, and then we'd pump that out to YouTube. Where we ended up at the end was it was all automated. Um, we could manually override, but by default, it would be automated, which saved us a lot of stress and uh, head scratching. But we also you know, we're talking about uh, managing risks, things like even if what three words was accurate, it may perhaps output a kind of inappropriate combination of three words. So we were able to just always check that before it went live. And you could just tweak because it, it's so accurate to a two meter square. You just go to the next square and it'd still be accurate, but it'd be, you know, you'd, you'd avoid that criticism. Um, partner working, as I touched upon uh, at the start, was really important. Um, when I called Steph, so the monarch died on the Thursday, late on. Friday, we got flags guidance out, closed all you know, outputs, changed all our channels, started to get the guidance out. Saturday morning is when I spoke to Steph about lining state and our plans. And we did have uh, plans alongside this. So we still pushed graphics and updates out hourly throughout lining state. But at the same time as talking to Steph, I also spoke to Google and told them about our plans. This was around 10 in the morning. And then we came back together at about two in the afternoon and said, right, where, where are we? What have we got and what, what can we do? Google were really helpful. They, um, as well as obviously we use their maps, they also renamed the pin for Lion in State. So if you searched in your own Google Maps, when the Lion in State started, it would show you that it's at the Palace of Westminster, just to avoid that confusion about where it was, given we had this queue and some people might not see the start and the end. Um, they, of course, took Google Doodles down and just put a, an, an appropriate color on the, the Google brand. And because Google are partners with, or that they are YouTube, we spoke to YouTube at the same time. They saw the tracker, they featured it on their 
um, UK homepage, and they also helped us do some fixes in the back end. So, for example, we live streamed concurrently for three or four consecutive days without switching the feed off. But we were also able to, if the map went down, we could put a holding screen up and it wouldn't automatically close the live. That was really important because we'd given that URL out to partners, including media partners, so BBC had it embedded as well as Sky and others. Um, so it just meant we had that extra layer of, of resilience. Uh, consistent messaging was key. You saw that from the tracker. What we were also doing and is it extracted elements from our guidance to drop in the tracker but and making sure that everybody had a way to access or as many people as possible did the messaging they were, we were pushing out and the updates so alongside the tracker we were tweeting hourly if not more frequently we were uh, extracting bits from the guidance that lived on gov uk and i'll come on to that in a second which which is the sort of home of where all the information came from and we'd worked on that for, for years to get that right and make sure it was optimized designed for the public not just written by policy people um, and this content ran across all our channels. You know, these were really clear, short messages. They were based on feedback we were seeing on social and they were based on feedback we were getting from people in the queue and the marshals. For example, people turning up and not understanding the queuing time or not preparing for the weather or not bringing enough water or whatever. We were able to quickly respond to that and put things on, on our social channels right down to things like acceptable bag size, which sounds daft, but if you queued for 20 hours and then you get to... Westminster Palace and get told you've got the wrong bag and you've got to leave it, you're going to be quite frustrated. So making sure that people could plan in advance, and this was particularly part of the messaging before the line is there even opened, to help people prepare what to do, where to go, what to expect, as well as you know transport advice. Um, going on to Gov UK, I've mentioned that, so I won't go through all of it, but this is just to give you a scale of the eyes we had on things. Flag flying, which was the first thing we put up, and we ran out very quickly in the morning and took a picture of the flag at half mass, as you can see here, had 135,000 uh unique visitors to that page and it was a very short uh piece of content that just basically told you to how to manage if you're a public building uh, your flag that volume of traffic was the same as the entire morning guidance we got for the duke of edinburgh so it shows how much people were focused on on the death of the monarch and how big an event this was Dance's content which went out later in the week ninety thousand. the morning guidance by cabinet office had six hundred and fifty thousand unique visitors which is massive and it's what we expected, but it also shows how much focus there was on Lining State with 836,000 unique visitors going to that page, find out what they needed to do, what they needed to bring, how they needed to prepare. And when you look at the data around how people um, responded to that page, you know, on Gov UK, there's a, did you get what you want from this page? 7,000 people clicked that and of those 94% said they got what they wanted, which for us, is one of the biggest successes because if that had been wrong or if they hadn't have understood it that would have massively impacted what we saw on the ground with with both queues um and it's also a lesson we take away and you know inform how we do guidance and this kind of thing in future um, and finally just some quick key learnings from us on what we learned um be ready, ready to pivot to new roles as needed so none of this would have been deliverable without the volunteers at the back of the queue or people across government and comms coming together to help us do this, establishing partners with stakeholders, media and social media platforms, as well as uh, YouTube and Google. I spoke to Twitter, Facebook and others, so they knew what we we're doing and what to expect. I also spoke to the, the media, so I had direct contacts to BBC and Sky to find out who we need to speak to if, for example, the live stream went down and we could give them a URL. The purpose of that was one, they'd have the most up-to-date one, and two, instead of that becoming a story in itself, uh, we they would work alongside us and help us get messaging out. Also partners like TFL, I'm talking mostly about digital content, but TFL were taking what we were saying in that tracker and having it read out on Tannoy's in stations, things like estimated queuing time or where the endpoint was people need to go to. And that was really helpful. And we saw that impact directly, people knowing where to go and how long to wait. So we didn't have loads of stuff on social about, I've arrived here, but I need to go here. This is frustrating, which was a massive relief for us. Um, make sure you've been listened to at the right level. I've worked on lots of projects where decisions are made on digital with people in the room who don't work on digital. So being in that room and being in that conversation and making sure that the end product is right for what we're trying to achieve. As an example of that, the tweet we put out to pause the queue, uh, to say it's paused, come back later, had 2.2 million impressions and was the most popular, if that's the right word, 
tweet of our year in 2022 about acute pausing because that's what people were looking for. So it was really vital that we were saying, this is how we're going to talk to the public. These are the channels they're using. Um, and this is the way to do that. Um, and the last thing is be prepared for, for plans to change in the moment. There's largely underpins everything we did here. This We had set plans to an extent for this event, but they can change. Route of the line of state could change, you know, volume of people or whatever. So being ready to be flexible. One example was the track was so successful, we realized on day one, we needed to run 24 hours because people could queue through the night. So we quickly pivoted to a 24-7 uh, shift pattern so that it wouldn't switch off during the night. And, you know, we had to service that, but we did. Um, hence why we were exhausted afterwards. That's, I'm sure you'll be thrilled to hear, is the end of our um, presentation. And I haven't been keeping an eye on comments. So if there's lots of questions in there, apologies if I've missed them. Um, people are welcome to put hands up or uh, shout out or Barry, if you want to help manage those, that'd be handy if people do have questions. Um, well, they, you've got two, you've got two questions in the chat and then I see a couple of people put their hands up. I'll just read out the questions in the chat. Did you generate any revenue from YouTube? We didn't because we are a department, but if we had, uh, it would have been in the region of £20,000 based on views. Fantastic. And the other question in the chat is, where do you start when you need to speak to YouTube and Google at short notice? How did you get the right contacts quickly? Was this sorted in the pre-planning? Uh, yes, it was. So I'd, I'd already been speaking to Google for some time about potential mapping solutions, and I had contacts there, so I, I wasn't going in cold. Um, but it's important, yeah, you have those contacts. Myself, the Palace, Number 10 and others, had spoken to social media providers, including Google, for, for some time and made sure we had regular check-ins because the planning for this has been in the years. So what Google and those platforms can do now is different to what they could have done four or five years ago. And that's why this would never be a sign sealed. There's the plan. It's ready to go. It was iterative all the time because new things had come on board. You know, what three words didn't exist when we first worked on this, for example. So, yes, we did. And then, sorry, I can see some other hands up, but um, because I'm on the web-based browser, I'm not sure I can see everyone who's... Right, so I call them out in order. Is that okay? Because, yeah, they come up in order. So Sarah is first. Is that Sarah Killarney? It is. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Um, um, thanks so much, Andrew and, and Steph, for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, I just um, I couldn't help... Uh, Picking up on uh, several references you made to staff being exhausted and 12, 18 hour days. Um, so from my perspective, I think one of the great things that a specialised delivery community can bring to a project is stopping that from happening or minimising it. Um, what do you think you'd learn from and, and things happened last minute and you made changes all the way like off the cuff almost uh, to your project um, with uh, which sounds really really great the effect that those um, changes had um, what would you learn though what could you learn from or what did you learn from uh, from the project that you ran in terms of how to minimize the disruption to staff hours worked um I think that in reality there was going to be disruption because it was a global event that was 24 seven and we live in a 24 seven media cycle. So I think staff hours was going to be impacted and the team were ready for that. And myself and my counterparts in pre press were ready to pivot to that shift pattern. We talked about this for some time and we were also quite clear that if you don't want to work in this way, you don't have to, you know, people weren't, weren't forced to, to work like this. It was all about people who were already involved. Having that volunteer network across government to be stood at the back of the queue. They didn't stand through the night. You know, we, we stopped that at, uh, it, it was, you know, late summer. So it was obviously daylight, but I think it was about 8 p.m. And there was always two people together and there were marshals. So safety was, a um, you know, paramount. But we had marshals through the night who gave us the data. So people weren't sending us data back through the night who were volunteers from the digital community. Um, but it's it's hard it's hard to plan to have a big team ready to work on this because you don't know when it's going to happen you know it's one of those things that will happen it's going to be huge and you can plan as much as you can we'd 
I'd, I'd worked on the Jubilee and led on on the digital comms for that. So we knew some bits we would be focusing on on how we push products out, and we had set people doing set things, particularly around the Gov UK content and the sort of messaging. But ultimately, you know, we were a small team, and people did end up tired. And it's not just comms; it was the whole ceremonials directorate of which it's a huge number it's just we had a huge amount to deliver is, is the unfortunate reality of it much so than duke of edinburgh's passing because that took place during covid so plans were scaled back and that was what was called windsor only and duke of edinburgh doesn't line in line state so those things meant we could plan certain things but this was still going to be much bigger i know that doesn't answer your question with this is what i do next time to avoid that because i think certain elements I'm not sure how I would. Should we move on to the next question? She's Konstantinos. Yeah, that's me. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really insightful, very interesting. Um, what do you think? Obviously, this is fairly recent. Um, what do you think the legacy of this kind of unprecedented operation will be on kind of Uh, I think there's two. I think one is we can, you know, we, we already live stream things. So we live stream Remembrance Sunday, which is a camera stuck out of a window on Richmond House that we then push through OSB onto Facebook and we get some big numbers on that because we get support from MOD and others. But the model we stood up really quickly for Lightning State and how we learn in that live environment has meant we can do that on a bigger, bigger scale. Um, and we can bring that to other events and we, you know, we, we've share this so it's not just dcms i think it's digital community across government that can benefit from this but the other thing is bringing the experts in you know if we weren't able to call upon steph on a saturday morning and say this is what we're thinking what do you think and i've, I've worked with steph on a number of big projects involving maps we would have had a plan b we would have pushed content out people would have got the information they need but probably not in as much of a easy to service dynamic way so having the right suppliers and being able to go straight to them if, if I'd have done this without just picking the phone up and saying, we'll have to pick up commercial and all the other bits, but this is what we're going to do, and just taking the lead on that, I don't think we'd have delivered it because we have 10 days to stand up, deliver it, make it work, and switch it off. Thank you. Uh, Ken. Thanks, Barry. Um, thanks, Andrew and Steph. That was fascinating. Uh, amazing work. Uh, I, I mean, from, from what I do, which is larger scale, I almost can't relate, you know, the agile delivery I do to the stuff you did. It was awesome. Um, you mentioned a few times rapid feedback and how important that was to you. Uh, people in the queue, people on social media, lessons that were coming out, you know, uh, human error because of tiredness, unforeseen stuff. I was interested in how in the moment, given how intense it must have been, how were you able to prioritize that stuff and how much of that was already like up front where you had some thinking about it and how, how did you manage that in real time? Um, so I've got a team of eight that all have different specialisms um, and Steph was kind of part of that team really. And we kept lots of the asks that were necessary away from Steph. You know, Focus was working on the technical side with, with colleagues in the team. But also it was a bit about being able to monitor and get context. So I had lots of people in the department and across government, uh, I, don't, I don't wanna say flapping, but you know, getting animated about certain things when in the real world, it wasn't a massive issue. One of them was that people can't watch YouTube on their own uh, browsers in, in DCMS. It's just a, a, a weird quirk of if you're logged in, if I'm logged in on this laptop as me, I can't watch YouTube. If I log in as a, on a different Google ID, I can. So lots of people, including ministers were saying streams down, we can't see it, you know, and just, I know that sounds simple, but having private officers and, and ministers come and talk to you and say, I can't, I can't watch it was, it was that kind of thing. And just sort of being able to call upon data and insight and say, this is the, you know, we were doing hourly sit reps on, this is what people were saying on social, I mean, really clear roles about monitoring who was doing that to say, this is the context of the conversation okay, you've seen four tweets by people who we think are important moaning about length of queuing time or, or marshals or whatever, but the sentiment across that whole community is this, and you have to manage it through that, that evidence. So otherwise you just get sidetracked trying to placate someone because they're senior. 
I was just going to add to that. Just um, you know, I think what was interesting here, which you wouldn't normally get with a lot of digital product products, is you know real time feedback from social media at scale. So I was sitting at my kitchen table watching people tweeting about things, um, and I could see people picking up this what three words thing, for example. So. Um, in some ways, I think what we were lacking as a team was probably a delivery manager in, in that sense, because that's not a concept that really exists in comms. You have project managers and obviously people who have specific specialisms, but you don't really have someone who's managing and coordinating a digital product in quite the same way, certainly not for this kind of thing. So essentially, I was picking this stuff up directly as a developer um, and looking at whether I could fix that on the staging server, sending a test link in sort of proactively. So I think. I mean, maybe that's partly about the beauty of social media as a feedback service when you've got something with that amount of visibility. Um, but also, I think, you know, getting your developers to see themselves as, as owning the solutions to the problems and, and coming up with solutions proactively and sharing them, particularly when you're, when you're under that kind of time pressure. Um, Nick. Hello. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for that. It was really interesting, and um, thank you for the like the detailed explanation of how it all came together. I've kind of got three a three part question. Well, it, hopefully, it all builds together. And um, so, you had to, to from what you've explained, you had to make some quite large architectural decisions quite early on in the project. It sounded like that was you know they had to be made quite quickly. Um, and so, my questions are sort of around uh, what you might uh, change if you ever did this again, and it sort of relates to. You, similar to the last question, actually, and, and what you've just talked about, um, Steph, about like the feedback that you got from people. Were there any decisions that you made that you thought actually that would have been a really good idea and we couldn't do it because, you know, um, based on sorry, the feedback, but you couldn't do it because of the decisions you've made? I'm thinking like the, the example I've got in my mind is like accessibility and the fact that you said that you had the accessibility updates on social channels, but that's different, a different page to the YouTube channels so like what we like is that something that you would reconsider in the future and that sort of feeds into the last part of the question which is how are you going to feed this learning and the things that you've um you've learned from this whole experience into planning for the next one of these because there will be one at some point and it might be sooner than the last one um so yeah it's sort of it's part of the architectural decisions what would you have changed if you had the opportunity and how are you going to pass that learning to the future. Okay, uh, Steph, is there anything what you'd change on, like architectural-wise, particularly with the tech? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it was less robust than you would expect, as you can see from my demo. You know, for a service of that visibility. Um, so, you know, although we we had we were lucky as 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 uh, Andrew described, having had that run through. With the Platinum Jubilee, he had all the right contacts in place with the relevant media and and social networks. Uh, we had hosting and stuff in place. I think that's been useful, and having kind of that certainly made me think how useful it is to have that stuff up and running, ready to go, um, and have someone you can call as a as a developer. So it was ha helpful. I was still essentially under contract, supporting something, and able to kind of pick it up straight away. Um, I think on accessibility, yeah, I think, I mean, what I, what I take away from the project is. It, that there are multiple ways to deliver this you know if you were thinking about it with a nice long lead-in you would probably build a more traditional digital service which people would access directly and have multiple entry points um, but because of the speed of it and the scale of it and also it coming from comms i suppose rather than the digital products digital service um, you know it being live streamed to youtube and then being sold into other partners uh, as a youtube kind of embed primarily uh, that made a lot of sense so yeah, I think it's a hard one. All I would say is, you know, I think it's a good argument for having thinking quite laterally about different ways of achieving, you know, meeting a user need. Um, and accessibility is definitely part of it. We didn't, you know, we tried to make sure that what we did was accessible, but it was uh, within the context of a YouTube live stream, not entirely obvious what that would be, I suppose, apart from making sure all the information was equally uh, published in accessible forms on other channels elsewhere. Yeah, and it, and it was. So the hourly updates we gave were taken from the live tracker, and that's when we updated the live tracker. So that the audience that were on other channels were getting the updates in the same time frame. It just perhaps didn't feel as live. But we'd also make sure, obviously, we'd use alt text, but we'd also, whatever was in that graphic was also the body, the copy of the post. 
So there were different ways to get that level of information. What would I change? Um, I mean, because the track was so successful, I spent a lot of time arguing about it wasn't the solution to everything. It started to be seen as we need to get this update out about bridges more generally, put it in the tracker because it's got so many eyes on it, particularly around the accessible queue, which was a slightly different queue. And we didn't run a tracker for that because it was a different queuing system with tickets. So it might imply a different mechanism than what it, what it was. Um, I mean, now we've got a model. We didn't have a model before. And I think what I'd change is we've got something to, to build upon rather than build from scratch. That, that's the position we're in now compared to before. Um, I think it'd be quite useful within Gov UK, because I know you're, you're from GDS can see your signature, to be able to embed, this was embedded in the guidance. So you'd go on the guidance about lining state and you'd see the map, you'd get everything at once, what I need to bring, where it is to inform your decision. But if you're able to embed stuff at a higher level, for example, on that Bridges topical page and not just YouTube, because we have the ability to live stream concurrently to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube all at once, if we choose to. We didn't for this because it just added extra layers of complication, but that is possible. And I, I think it would be useful within Gov UK to embed other types of video, not just YouTube, and also think about that live experience at different levels. Um, and what else I change? Uh, job before uh, there's another bridge. Amazing. Um, on that, just to mention, um, I'm not sure if it's picked up again yet, but the, you know that there's like the, the, the general bridges planning that happens. I'm sure there'll be somebody on gov.uk who would love to talk to you about that. Um, and there's definitely more investment after all the things that have taken those teams time over the last few years, like Brexit and coronavirus. There's a lot more um, emphasis now being put on improving the publishing system. Um, so definitely a good time to talk to them about like how we could, yeah, make it work for on gov.uk better, better than it did last time. I, I think it worked well, by the way, that's not a criticism. It, it worked brilliantly. I just wonder where we could take it next. Fabulous. That's the, that's all the questions we've got. We've got four minutes left. Um, oh. Got another hand from Darren. Thanks, Barry. No, brilliant talk, guys. Really enjoyed that. Um, and I asked you when I at Google and YouTube, but also interested. Um, whilst you got some experience from doing the the Jubilee, did you do a proof of concept or a dummy run for this? So it, it sounds like there was a lot of pieces that had to all come together. But did you try and replicate that beforehand just to try out any glitches, or was it a case of? You just had to hope it, it all kind of meshed together based from previous experience. Um, so we know that OBS works into YouTube and that's the window that captured the map and pushed out. So we knew that was stable. We knew we could push something out to YouTube. What we didn't know is how long you could leave a live up before it automatically switched off. And the map element, that was relatively new and we tested it in the office alongside other things. One thing I tested, which Steph referred to early on, was I, I, on, on the Saturday, I walked over Westminster Bridge and just joined up two Google accounts, switched one map on, switched the other off, and you could see my location. You could have done it with one phone, but the networks wouldn't have held up. But that was another thing we tried. Um, but Steph, I think we, in the time we had, we had, Lightning State began four or five days in. So we spent those days testing this amongst ourselves. Yeah, uh, we had a little staging environment which mirrored live, um, so we could test new stuff out on there. Um, we had, uh, the, the nice thing about scale was we weren't having to worry about, you know, huge volumes of traffic on the service itself. So I wasn't having to worry about, you know, keeping keys too private. I was able to just keep that all nice and simple. Um, but it also, again, back to that kind of progressive enhancement thing, you know, essentially Andrew phoned up and said, here's what we're planning. Is there a better way of doing this? Um, so if, you know, the answer had been it's not possible, then it was a perfectly good solid plan b you know um but this was just a sort of an enhancement to what but you know i suppose from andrew phoning me up to initial proof of concept i think it was pretty like four or five hours of just like playing around with the google because google maps is great you know it's got a nice simple api and people forget about how easy and simple the google Maps static api is but it's really nice even if you're not a hotshot developer it's um you get quite a long way quite quickly so um yeah i think basically having yeah. having the, the hosting ready to go was was a big help 
five hours. That is the shortest kind of discovery or alpha. Um, really brilliant. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, I think we are just about out of time now. So I will say a huge thank you. It has been absolutely fascinating. And a lot of people have picked up on doing things quickly and with existing components and stuff. And I think there's lots of lessons there to everyone. So uh, perhaps everyone, thank you very much. Um, next time, um, yeah, yeah, round of round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fascinating presentation. Next time we are doing a session on psychological safety, an uh, interactive session on psychological safety so bring along your um your tools techniques tips hints problems and we will attempt to solve those because that's one of the key things for teams and the session after we have mike bainbridge from amazon uh, who is an absolutely hugely engaging speaker um we had him at the dwp delivery conference and he had everyone wrapped and on the edge of their seats. So um, thank you, everyone, and especially to our uh, our uh, two presenters. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.